intensive internal mag uh, magnitude, okay, or even just the quality. So here, here's the question Menger asked to solve that problem of what is the value of one sack of wheat. He said to himself, or he said to his readers, uh, what would happen if, let's say, some vermin break into the shelter where we had the wheat stored, and let's say it um, consumed the bag or the sack that was earmarked for the second highest ranked N, okay, that is bread to sustain his health. Okay. What, 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 would, what would Menger, as an economizing man, do? Well, you, you can see the answer right away. Would he go without the bread to sustain his health? Of course not. He would rearrange his resources so that he was economizing them, so, he was, so that he was achieving only the highest ranked ends that he could with that supply of the good. So he would give up making vodka. Okay, it'd be a terrible thing, but he'd, he'd give it up. Okay. And that's true of no matter which sack he lost. So the marginal utility is the relevant, when you see marginal, it's the relevant, it's the unit that you're considering. So the relevant utility, utility is another word for satisfaction, the relevant satisfaction of a sack of wheat is simply the satisfaction from consuming the vodka. That is what he values a sack of wheat at. No matter which one it is, that's the value. Now, what would happen to the value if he lost that first sack? Okay, now he only has four sacks left. Well, that's the law of modern utility. As you increase the uh, supply of a good that an individual, an individual possesses, the value, the marginal utility of the good falls, and so does its value. And of course, that holds in reverse. As you decrease the supply of, uh, of a good that an individual um, possesses, the the um, margin utility rises, that is the, 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 the least satisfaction that you can achieve with, with, with that supply increases, and so does the value. Okay? So wheat is now more valuable to Robinson Crusoe. Okay? On the other hand, if he, fa he, he found that he could, uh, with fertilizer, get a sixth sack of wheat, then he would feed a parrot, which has a lower value than consuming the vodka, and therefore the value and the margin utility of, of the good would fall. Or rather, the margin utility, which controls the value, would fall. Let me give you a, a quiz, a little quiz here. Let's say there's a farmer who has two different goods that satisfy different ends, are not interchangeable, like we're assuming the wheat was all interchangeable, was, there were identical sacks, and this is how he ranks the uses that he can put these two um, uh, animals too. So the horse can be used, most important end is to use the horse for plowing wheat. Second most important is to add the second horse to the uh, team and make him more productive in producing wheat. Um, the third end is, is, is to have milk, okay, and so one cow can, can give him milk. Uh, and then uh, the fourth is to have beef, okay, so a second cow would be used for beef, uh, and he has a, a supply of two cows. And then the, th the, the third horse would be used for recreational riding. So we can ask Menger's question, what if the barn's burning, right, and you can save four of the five animals, okay? What's, what's the lower valued animal? So, so yeah, the horse is, is going to be the lower valued animal. You don't look at, at the higher end of the of value scale. What you do look at is the um, relevant satisfaction, satisfaction that must be give, given up. So, Looking at that value scale as it is, we call it a value scale, a ranking of values, we would say with those animals that the cow has a higher value than the horse. Right now, the cow has a higher value than the horse. Once the horse is lost in that fire, what happens? Now the margin utility of beef is lower than the margin utility of the second horse that increases productivity. So now the horse becomes the higher valued animal. But Menger went beyond that. He came up with an, another notion that helps us explain pricing in the whole economy. Oh, by the way, of course. So then how did Menger solve the paradox of value? Menger solved the paradox of value very simply by pointing out that we value diamonds in units just as we do 
any other good. We value uh, bread in units. Let's say it's the water, uh, it was called the water diamond paradox, but let's use bread, the bread diamond paradox. In a normal situation, Uh, there's much more, many, many more pounds of bread in the world than there are carrots of diamonds. Okay, so, so diamonds may be ranked very, um, uh, may have a much higher price than bread. But ask yourself, if you're in the desert and you've been there for three days, okay, and you're on, on, on the point of, of um, dying of thirst, and you had that pink diamond, that $46 million pink diamond in your pocket, and someone came up to you with a gallon of water, which you would need to, to stay alive, would you, tr would you trade the, the pink diamond for the gallon of water? Yes, of course you would. The reason being that the relevant unit of water, since you have none, it's extremely scarce, the relevant unit of water is higher in value than the, the relevant diamond. Okay, you're, you're gonna choose the water over the diamond. So in that situation, uh, the water has a higher value. Okay. In a normal situation, water is much more abundant than diamonds. So even though water might be very, very high on your value scale, on, on almost everyone's value scale, water has a much lower value than diamonds because it serves much lower ranked ends. And that's why, as I, I mentioned before, air has no value to us in a normal situation. Right? So because if we lost one cubic foot of air from this room, no one would notice it. It wouldn't impinge on anyone's satisfaction. Okay. However, if someone's going to the moon, or if someone is, is a deep sea diver, or someone has uh, emphysema, and it's a, a, a day where, uh, in Los, uh, like a normal day in Los Angeles, a lot of smog, uh, then you would pay to, to purchase a supply of air. Okay. So it, so it all depends on the situation of the individual, his values, his means, and so on. Okay. So the concrete situation. Menger always used the word concrete to refer to the real situations. Okay. So let's go on to orders of goods. I have a few mi more minutes here. Um, Menger said that there are steps in producing consumer goods. We have to progressively transform certain elements, beginning with land and labor, into what we later call capital goods, and then finally transform them into the good that we consume, okay? So the high, he called the higher order goods, those goods that were further away from the consumers, those that were less ready for consumption and would take more time, such as iron ore mining, steel production, all uh, those higher order goods. And uh, the lower order goods were those goods that were closer to consumers. The final order good was, of course, a consumer good the automobile at the dealer. And what's important about this is that Menger realized and was able to show just why the cost of production theory of the classical economists was wrong. And what he pointed out is that value is imputed backwards. People don't value the automobile because it costs a lot to dig iron out of the ground in the, sometime in the past, no one cares about that. When you go into an automobile, you don't think about, wow, the guy, the guy who was working on that steel, he, he, it was a hard job and there, there was a lot of resources involved. No one thinks about that. What they think about is, how does this car improve my welfare compared to other things I could purchase with this sum of money? That's what you think about. You're always, value is a forward-looking phenomenon, not a backward-looking phenomenon, okay? And here's a little diagram of that. Notice that production goes in one direction. It goes from the higher order goods to the lower order goods, from the farm tools to the wheat to the flour, which is um, the wheat's ground into flour and flour is then baked into bread and bread is then transported to the, to the supermarket and then you purchase it. Okay. But notice value goes the other way. So consumers don't value the bread because it costs a lot some money to, to produce the bread. In fact, the, the consumers don't value the, the loaf of bread at all. What consumers actually value, and this wasn't Menger who, who, who saw this, but his, his student, Bon Bavark, pointed out that what we value are the services from the bread. We value what we expect 
our satisfaction to be when we actually eat the bread in the form of a sandwich, let's say. Okay? So um, with a, a one-time good like bread that you consume right away, that might be a little difficult to understand. But you, you value the car that's sitting in your driveway not because you like the car itself, not because you attach a value to the car directly, but because you attach a value to the transportation services or the showing off services if it's a really cool car that you get from having, owning that car. And then you impute that back to the car itself. So all that, that stream of satisfaction into the future is, what's the, is the basis of the value of the automobile itself. Okay. And then, uh, then all the way up, things go back, right? The only reason why the steel and, and, and the electricity and the factory space are valuable is because the car that, that they produce is valuable. So Meng Menger used a very good example. He said, um, what if people stop smoking cigarettes? They, they suddenly believe that they're bad for your health and they stop smoking uh, uh, cigarettes altogether. What would happen to the value of the cigarettes? Well, they would fall to zero, right? But not only the value of cigarettes, the value of cigarette rolling machines would fall to zero. The value of, of the, um, the premises, uh, if it couldn't be used for anything else, on which the, the cigarettes were produced would fall to zero. And most importantly, the value of land would fall, uh, uh, let's say the land could only produce tobacco leaves. That would fall to zero. The classical school could never explain why land had a price. So they said, well, land's a monopoly. There's, there's not enough land in the world. Everybody can't have it. So the people that have it are monopolists, and they charge a monopoly price. Menger showed, no, no, it's the consumers that determine the value of land. Uh, let me just tell you one more story before I, I end. So a few nights ago, I, I saw the movie Witness again. I, I like that movie quite a bit. It's about the Pennsylvania Dutch. Um, Harrison Ford stars in it. It's, a, it's kind of a police thriller. It takes place in southeastern Pennsylvania where there are Amish. And there's a scene in, in the um, uh, movie where um, he's, he's in hiding, Harrison Ford, uh, from people that want to kill him. And he's living among the Amish. And he can't find the buttons on, on his shirt. And she says, well, we're plain people. Uh, we don't wear any sort of adornments. And in fact, we just have eyes and hooks, just little loops and, and, and a little um, metal piece that we put in. We don't even want buttons. So if everyone had the, um, adopted the values, let's say, of the Amish, let's say everyone in the United States did, um, what would happen to the value of diamonds? Not only do they not have buttons, obviously they don't have any jewelry. The value of diamonds would fall to zero, okay. despite how much it costs to mine diamonds. What would happen to the value of, or, or the, the wages or salaries of the, the very specialized gem appraisers? Well, suddenly, no one would pay anything for a gem appraiser. And of course, what would happen to the value of diamond mines? Fall to zero. So Men what Menger has done to sum up is to explain how prices are determined throughout the economy in all orders of goods, starting with human beings at the center, okay? And through the notion of causation, okay, that the wants cause all of this phenomenon. Everything you see around us, if you go to New York City and see the, the skyline, all of those things were built or constructed because of, of, of human uh, um, wants, okay? And they, in turn, then satisfy the human wants. So that was Menger's vision, and I'll stop there. Thank you. Okay, so we have a 15-minute...